Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Parker from the University of Manchester, and this short talk is going to be about literature analysis, in particular literature reviews. Now, the topics that we're going to cover are revisiting what literature actually is, what makes a comprehensive literature review, um, looking at your literature sources, how you find them, and then how to reference properly or perfectly. And this is going to be useful for university students, particularly those in the final years. So let's start to look at what a literature review is. So it's having purpose and content. Now you can think about it in many different ways, but lots of people go, oh, it's a straightforward summary of everything you've read on the topic. Just list it and there it is. Give it in chronological order, describe what's happened, and it's a bit like a history book. Now that definition isn't actually correct. When we look at the definition, I'm going to read this out. Um, literature review is part of a dissertation where there is extensive reference to related research and theory in the field. It's where its connections are made between the source text that you draw on and where you position yourself amongst these sources. Now, in this way, you can say that there's a whole load of theories. You can say uh, these theories are compatible with each other. However, this discovery could contradict a previous one, could, could contradict something else. Um, maybe there's not clarity in the area. So you say, well, given that we have this perspective, our customers are from here, uh, our users are from there, the way which we decide to focus on is here. We can actually discredit the other one or say that the other one works in a field that isn't relative. So for example, uh, we could say um, shopping. You could say when we're shopping in a big retail store, the theories of how people look at items, why they're shopping, how much time they spend, uh, what motivates them to purchase something, um, why they engage. That's There's going to be theories around that. But when we're talking about why someone's shopping on a mobile app on the way home from work, on a bus, um, on a rainy day, we're looking at a very different context. So there's going to be different theories about the motivations of the consumer there. So we can say, well, there are the different motivations. They're not equal. We pick the ones equal to where we are. So, it's an opportunity to, to engage with a written dialogue, with research in the area whilst at the same time showing that you have engaged with, understood and responded to the relevant volume of knowledge underpinning your research. Now, the understanding part's really important here. So, it's not just saying, hey, I've got a whole load of theories, there they are, isn't this great? It's going, look, this is the theory, this is what it means. It's not just good enough to put a model in there, just saying, here's a model. You've got to say, here's model, and here's how it's used. Here's how it's been applied in different fields. Here's how it's benefited people. So be very careful about how you put things forward. You are providing historical context. So a degree of this how the field starts is useful, but in many cases, that has to be quite short. Having 20 pages on the history of um, shopping isn't that relevant to what's happening today. So don't overload that. But you give the overall um, current context of where it's situated. So what are ev what is everyone saying? What are different fields saying? How are different perspectives working? So is, uh, back to the shopping context, uh, if we've got two different theories about why people are motivated to shop, the fact that there's difference shows that the concept of consumer motivation is complex. So you can give an appraisal of all of it and go, you know, here it is, this is how it means. Show relevant theories and concepts for your research. So once again, you can give the overall feel that actually these ones aren't, these ones are. It proves that your work's going to be actually doing the right thing. Uh, giving definitions of relevant terminology, that's very important because um, there's certain things in design, for example, um, where you can know the phenomenon but using the wrong words. If you use the wrong words, then it's quite clear that you don't really know what you're talking about. So um, the crowdsourcing is something which has been very important over the last 10 years. Now, this can be applied in um, consumer shopping area, such as reviews and websites. So you might see a fashion app which has reviews of clothes or reviews of items. You might see a technology website um, saying reviews of computers. All this stuff is used generated content. Now, if you called it something else, rather than user-generated content or crowdsourcing, um, those two terms are quite interchangeable to some degree, and called it um, consumer insights, then you're 
pretty much giving you a red flag that you haven't really read literature properly and to a certain degree you're making stuff up and that's not a good place to be in. So it gives you confidence that you have done the research properly and you know how to provide it properly. You are giving relevant research in a field and how the work extends this and addresses the gap in previous work. So not so much at undergrad level, but definitely at master's and PhD level, you're doing research into something. You're discovering something. Now, if you can give a very detailed overview of everything that's been found and where the gaps in the knowledge are. So, for example, um, we may know a lot about the motivation to people shopping in stores, but we don't know much about motivation to people shopping in uh, M-commerce apps, so iPhone app shopping, with relation to social aspects. So how does social media sharing, such as Facebook, Twitter, WeChat, um, how does that influence your shopping behavior? Now, you can um, say, right, here's how things known. No one's yet researched this. These papers around there have said that we need to research this, therefore this area needs research. So by addressing the wide range of the field, apart from um, highlighting how things similar and different, you're also saying that um, what you're doing really is worth it. You can also point out that if you do this, then you can address these questions that will let you do more things. So once we understand how social media does impact people, we can go forward and we can design apps which have a very targeted approach to social media. So rather than chucking social media in, we can say, well, we're going to apply it here in this way because this will best motivate the customer to make a purchase. And finally, um, to provide supporting evidence for a practical problem which your research is addressing. That's very similar to the area above. So we now know that your review is more than just a series of facts. It's a discussion that's actually playing about what things are. So how do we find the best sources? But before we get into that, I'm going to tell you a research story. So this fictional student called Mia grew up in Japan, and over there, there's a big thing about blood type personality. It's good to know it's not just Japan, it's lots of Asian countries, but originated from Japan. And, you know, her friends all talk about blood type. The parents say, oh yeah, we work well because we're a good blood type personality. There's TV shows, magazines. And she went to university. And she learned how to do research and find sources. And she found lots and lots of good um, uh, papers and journals, <coughs> which says that you know, but her personality is true. She uses as a um, central theory of uh, the true view, and she failed with thirty five percent. Now, she used scientific journals. She went to the actual proper sources. She pulled them out, referenced the right, and said, "Right, blood type personality." does in influence personality traits. No. What's in your veins influences how you are. What's in your veins will influence how you shop. So we could say that this blood type personality, um, this blood type should go into these shops, or maybe we have blood type areas of shops for shopping, or maybe blood type shopping guides. She said this, but she failed. Why did she fail? And the reason she failed is because she didn't read the rest of the research, which completely damns this theory to hell. It is complete pseudoscience and it does not work. There's a, this is just a small selection of literature which disproves it, but it highlights how if you read the read previous research, then which is here, this is not done scientifically. The papers aren't actually very good, and the good papers prove it's not true. And it's um, if anything, it's self fulfilling phenomenon. So you believe it's true. So it's true. So in the literature review, it's not just about finding something which agrees with what you think or the first things which kind of sound good. It's weighing up both sides equally and saying, right, what is actually going on? Now, come back to this guy here, which is Donald Rumsfeld. You might know him. And he famously said that there are known knowns. So things that we know, we know. The sun rises, we know that. Things that are unknown, are things that are known, but we don't know them. Uh, no known unknowns. And that's things like, I know that a nuclear reactor works in a certain way based on physics. I don't have a clue what that physics is. I'm not going to pretend to, but I know that if I walk over to the um, physics department, there's a professor there who can explain to me, and I can know it. So I know to go to him and know to find it. Then there are no unknown unknowns. There's things that we do not know, that we do not know. 
Now, if we go back to, in history to someone like Isaac Newton, who's probably the most intelligent person ever to live. So he um, invented calculus on a bet because um, his um, enemy, Robert Hooke, said that he could not work out how planets move. He invents calculus, this advanced math formula, and then he turns 25. It's absolutely astonishing, and he does so much amazing work, but he could not begin to fathom the work of astronom- astronomy that we know today. He actually um, said that um, God must be moving the planets to a certain extent because he was unable to work it out. Fast forward 200 years, and you know, everyone worked out quite clearly. So he did not know. And he didn't, if he was around today, he'd say that he wouldn't know to look there. So your own perspective can blind you. Having the literature, going into it, reading sources that you wouldn't normally read can open your eyes and let you discover things that you did not know, um, that you didn't know. The other thing is that there are wrong knowns. I've heard an example before, and there's things that we think are true, but simply are not true. Now, one common example is that women love shopping and men hate shopping, and this really is not true in the broad sense, in that you look into, um, when you take shopping apart, you know, what is shopping, what is browsing, what is buying purchase behaviour, and you've got all these motivation theories, and you're right, how do women and men behave differently on each area of the motivation theory? Women are definitely stronger in other areas, but men are also stronger in other areas, but women aren't, and in many areas, the genders recall. So this commonly held belief isn't correct, really, even though you hear it spouted all over the place. The other thing is, why is it? You know, why is it that men don't go cr- as crazy for clothes shopping as women tend to do? And partly that could be the nurture effect. If you're a guy, you're born in a society that isn't, hasn't got that much focus on men's fashion. You're shopping and there's not that much focus in the shops on men's fashion. The adverts aren't there. Your friends aren't doing it. So... Are you likely to to become obsessed with, with shopping if you um, grew up in a different society where there was reversed? So women didn't have much in the shops and didn't have much adverts, would the, and the men did. Would the theories be saying, oh, men naturally love shopping and women naturally do not shop shopping? So this is an area where you look into the show and go, yeah, that's how we are. Importantly, we only know what we know. And literature reviews that discover what we do not know. So where do we go to discover the information? So there's lots of different sources. So Google lets us find stuff. Other search engines are available. But just Googling isn't enough. So you want to have good sources, government information, company websites. Blog can be good. Now, um, here in the military science, we have a very good blog written by academics. Um, there's lots of bad blogs written by people who just go, I reckon something, therefore. Um, it can give you insight. So if your um, research is about consumer opinions, going to blogs which give consumer opinions is great, but you've got to take this pinch of salt. Wikipedia, again, um, you shouldn't reference it really, but it can be a good start for some things, particularly the scientific areas, but Google is okay. Um... Generally, on the internet, you'd be thinking about something like uh, Mintel or WGSN, um, these actual good companies. Um, Google Scholar is my favourite by far. That lets you find academic articles, so items that have passed peer review. So if you want to write a academic journal, you generally have to go through a quality control process. As we've just seen, though, Not all journal articles are equal. There are some not very good journals out there, and there's some incredibly good journals. So be aware of what makes a good journal. And the more you read, the more you work out which are the good ones. Now, there is um, ways of searching, such as um, El Sevier is a publisher, Sevier generally does very good ones, but that's the thing for another day. So library search, going to the library, finding books and ebooks, that's generally very good because it's been curated by librarians saying all of this source is good. And then finally, you have subject databases, very similar to the first the internet searches, um, such as uh, Mintel WGSN, who put out actual reports. 
So it's good to, if you're actually watching this with someone, you can take five minutes, choose two sources and discuss how they're similar and how they're different. Um, but obviously this is web talk, so we'll see, keep this one for now. Things to consider when you're reading a journal or a book, or an ebook or a report or anything is firstly, reliability. Who created it? Are they objective? Are they um, doing it with a bias or are they doing it um, just as exploratory? And then relevance. Is it actually relevant to what you're finding? You could write pages and pages and pages and pages about any topic you choose, but only some of it will be relevant to what you need to do. So when you're marking a thesis as an academic, you really don't want to go through pages and go, what was that about? You want everything relative to the question. So if you're trying to find something out, if you've got a question about um, consumer motivation in e-commerce, make sure that everything you're finding is in some way directly related to consumer motivation in e-commerce. Um, how the phone works is completely relevant. You know, we don't need to know about the hardware in the phone. We need to know about the consumer motivation aspects. Many of the questions that are useful to guide you in this is what, why, when, where, how, and who. If you ask all these questions, all the W's and 1H, then that will help you assess these. And you can look at some areas and go, actually, this is not worth it. I will not um, take this on board for my review because it isn't a good quality source. It's not reliable. It's not um, from a good journal. It's not from a good body. It's not got good objectivity. Um, maybe it's just too old. You know, something from the 1980s isn't relevant for today. And relevance to the question at hand. Now we come to, um, we found a source and referenced them. I strongly encourage everyone to use Mendeley. It's absolutely fantastic. It's free software that helps you categorize your references. So you can keep on one place, you can add notes, you can keep PDFs, make notes on them, mark up. And more importantly, you can add citations to your document. So you don't need to ever worry about how to reference it in style. It'll put the citation in text, it'll put the full reference at the end in the reference list, and it just works incredible. If you go to mendeley.com and download that, there's loads of tutorials there. I thoroughly recommend everyone looks into it. Um, Obviously, Google Scholar is a great resource to uh, find items. And this is a quick video of how you actually can take a search for Google Scholar into Mendeley. So it's very simple. We've got our item here, found a paper, press our web plugin. There it is, save. It's now in our Mendeley list. We are writing our text. Insert citation, search for it, there we are. One click, okay, there it is. You see it in there. Reference list, add the bibliography, and there we are. That is as simple as it is. It's that fast. It's a great resource, and I'd say it's free. I can't say enough good things about it. Now, if you want to learn, um, the uh, there's a playlist on the FashionWorks Manchester um, YouTube channel. There's a QR code there if you want to scan it, but I'm going to put a link in the description to this video. So I'd thoroughly encourage everyone to download the software, take a look at this, and actually have a go at using it. So, in summary, we've looked at what literature is. We've looked at what makes a comprehensive review. We've re revisited source literature and we've looked at how to reference properly. So, if you want to go back to the beginning of this um, video and quickly watch it again, this will help remind you how to do a literature review really well. If you've got any questions, please leave them as comments at the end of this video, and I hope you found this useful.